The following interview was conducted with John D. Harden, Jr., uh, b um, Bachelor of Science in Agricultural Economics and Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, April 10th, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Harden. Well, thank th you. Thank you for the invitation. And let's start off and tell us where, when you were born and your parents in early years. Okay. Uh, I was born October 25th, 1944. Uh, my father, John D. Hardin Sr., uh, had moved to our family farm, which was seven miles west of the Circle in Indianapolis. Uh, he is a 1940 graduate of Purdue in uh, agricultural education. My mother, Lily Marin Hardin, uh, uh, was a young housewife at that time. And uh, I had one sister that followed that, uh, Jeanette Hardin, whose married name now is Scholenberger. And Jeanette was, uh, eventually became a graduate of Purdue as well. What were your early years, and where did you go to grade school, and then talk a little about high school? Okay, well, um, I was, uh, had, uh, the high school and grade school that I first started at was Ben Davis. And uh, in 1955, I think primarily as a result of Brown versus Board of Education, the school bus had always, uh, I lived on a small farm that on the back side of that farm, on different property, was a uh, two-street uh, Negro subdivision of small houses and everything from nice houses to shacks. And prior to 1956, the kids in that school bus went around our farm and to a different grade school. There were 13 grade schools that fed Ben Davis. And so those kids, uh, those kids went to Bridgeport grade school. And in 1956, I began to go to the grade school at Bridgeport with those kids. And one memory that I will, and, and my life as I think about the races, has been through quite a change over my lifetime because a number of families back there had had people work for our family. Sure. And I can remember uh, that particular grade school had about half of its kids that went to a, a trailer park, lived in a trailer park, so they, they weren't very well to do. And I was a little guy, and I was getting hassled the first day there. And I can remember a young man named Walter Wathen. Uh, who, whose family, he was the youngest of nine, and he, they'd all worked for us. But at any rate, Walt went up to this fellow and kind of punched him in the chest, and he, he looked like he was about 18 when he was 13. And he said, you leave that young man alone. He's Mr. Hodden's son. <laughs> and uh, so we've had a journey since then about sure. how we think about races, and I've certainly learned a lot in my time at Purdue, yeah. even on the board. Right. Did you graduate from Ben Davis? Yes. Oh. I, I then I, I ended up going from Bridgeport Grade School to Ben Davis. Uh, I was on the debate team and an okay. extemporary speaker. Uh, never acted, but was a stage manager a lot, and was also active in 4-H, uh, both from the pigs that we raised on the Hardin farm and then in, in a contest called vegetable judging and that was one of the things that helped me get to Purdue uh, although I it was just ordained that I would go but uh, <laughs> I won a state contest and that won me a scholarship so that my tuition and fees never went above sixty five dollars a semester the four years I was at Purdue Good. so 4-H had a role and it had a later role when I was at right. Purdue but I grew up as one of four farm kids in a high school of 2200 so so I didn't date farm girls. I, my life was quite different than most of the kids that I ran into when I came to the School of sure, Agriculture. Right. You're talking about the judging. I've seen some pictures in the archives and the debris. There used to be a tomato judging contest at one time that over years, and it was sort of interesting. So that I, when you're saying vegetables, there used to be some, and people don't think about that today. Well, in so. fact, there was a contest every fall that we did here at Purdue, and there were all sorts of pieces of, to this. But, I, I imagine, right. So, it was sort of a nice event to have. Well, it, uh, it was interesting. Uh, we were the national champions in 4-H, but my two teammates, one spent his career as a pathologist, and the other one ended up being a research mathematician at Cal Poly. So sometimes it's good just to pick the right teammates. <laughs> right. No, I understand. Okay. Well, let's move on then. You, your career path, you have the farm, and then, um, but also you, you were a research associate at the Indiana Medical uh, Program, Regional yeah. Medical yeah. Program. Well, again, uh, at Purdue. Yeah, well, tell us about Purdue. Uh, Purdue. I was, uh, I wanted to be in agricultural economics, and I had a number of people telling me I needed to do something else, but that's what I really wanted to do. And uh, 
and uh, and that career went fairly well. And early on, I began to debate for the department at Purdue uh, on issues of uh, we'd have an annual debate at the American Farm Economics Association, and I did that a number of years. And one year, I had the very best partner I could have, and we won that national championship. And it was over the issue of uh, of whether it was better to have aid or trade or help people grow more food as a way of solving world hunger. And that was in the summer of 1966. So I have a lifetime of, of experience in thinking about that. And one of the neat things for me was that as a, as a sophomore when I began that, and through the years, I was here during the Johnson administration. And the Purdue Agricultural Economics Department provided a lot of the intellectual capacity that governed farm programs during Republican administrations. Right. So one of my father's fraternity brothers, a, a real icon here named Don Perlberg, I got a chance to be with Don at 18. And he was, when he was here? He was here as a professor and he would help us as we prepared for the debates. What and a treat. Well, and the, the most important thing, and when I won later awards, I always mentioned Don, he taught me lessons that stayed true throughout my life. You know, in agriculture, the technology changes, but ethical uh, business models, uh, ways of doing financing, some other things stay true. Yeah. And and was a, just great lessons. I can remember being full of myself and talking about how if we just taught them better technology, all would be well. And in these places where there are very low resource, resources, you've had people who might have had a thousand years to figure out the best way to do things with what they have available. Right. Right. And, uh, and then uh, after my junior year, I was selected to be an International Farm Youth Exchange E. And I spent about eight months in New Zealand between my junior and senior years at Purdue. And uh, because I have a difficulty with foreign languages, it was good to go someplace where they spoke English. But I lived uh, with 17 different farm families and you know, gave an awful lot of speeches about America, a real cultural exchange. And uh, from the day I got here as a trustee, nearly 30 years later, I've always encouraged all I can to see that students get international experiences. Right. Were you, you went to school at the same time you were there? Uh, I was there? not in school, although okay. I did uh, some fun university debates at both Lincoln and Massey Colleges down there. Uh, it was more of a cultural exchange. But the idea that young people can really turbocharge their career if they can operate somewhere else besides here. And the other thing is, once you stay in a foreign place long enough, that the way they do things makes sense means you will never look at your, the society you came from quite the same way. Okay. You'll have a broader vision. And uh, much as the military or Peace Corps helped me, helped others, uh, I was a different student when I came back from my last year. I had had that year of maturation. Yeah. Were you in the fraternity when you were here? Uh, that's a, I eventually became an Alpha Gamma Rho, of which okay. I'm both a legacy and, uh, and the father of um, a young man who's just ready to be the president of that corporation is, as an adult. So uh, that's where our closest ties are. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> well, then uh, you are also on the, uh, tell us about the Agricultural Advisory Committee for Trade to the U.S. Trade Representative. Okay, well, yes. if you don't mind, I'll sure. try to take things in, uh, yeah, in some order. Uh, I began, I raised pigs for a living. Okay. And I began to be active in the National Pork or in the State Council, and I was very soon sent off to the National Pork Producers Council. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I should backtrack and say that in 1964 I won the Alpha Zeta speech contest with here in this building with a speech about uh, how agricultural trade would improve the lot of both the people that were coming and and the United States farmers. So. I began to work on that, and then I was also the lead person for Pork the Other White Meat. Okay. And, um, and uh, starting in year two of that campaign, and it soon became an example that, or that's not the right word, but it soon became evident that even though we increased demand in the United States, the real place for us to grow is other places. And uh, in 1985, we were exporting $100 million worth of pork a year. And in February of this year, we 
exported 787 million in the month. So we've seen a 45 time increase since the mid 80s. And it's the example of how Americans can compete if they're focused. Now, you brought up, I became a spokesman for that. And at the policy for trade, uh, you know, we were advising on trade negotiations. And because I was a relatively pure play compared to many others in agriculture, because there are parts of American agriculture like sugar and peanuts that they're all about keeping things out. You understand? I understand, right. And the problem is when we go somewhere else to negotiate a trade deal, when we deal with their concerns, that means those of us that are competitive can't get in or get in at a, at a much reduced rate. So uh, it was a real privilege I would think so. to be part of a number of international trade negotiations. And if, if you care for this, a couple okay. of brief anecdotes. Please do. Uh, when we completed the NAFTA negotiations, which was with Mexico and Canada, there was an implementation period where what you traded before moved at no duty. And the Mexicans came back to us with a tonnage that was twice as much as what we knew we'd been sending to Mexico. And come to find out, there had been, they'd been importing American turkey as pork because the duty was were lower. And so we went through the, from 1994 to 2004, moving forward with that. And then in 2004, when all duties were off, our exports still doubled. But, uh, uh, and lots of memories from being in Geneva in times of high drama. Uh, these things take a very long time. Oh, sure. And uh, even small, I don't think many of my farm neighbors would ever want to put up with it. But I feel good about the efforts that were done there. Yeah, and it's, it means a lot for, not yeah. only for us, but for the people that you're negotiating with, mm -hmm. too. And, and I followed that up with, and in fact, I was president of the National Pork Council when I got a call from the dean in 1992, and actually in September 1991, asking me if I'd ever thought about being a trustee to Purdue. And I... Was uh, this the dean of agriculture? Yes. Okay. And I'm in a seat that is elected by the Alumni Association that has to be a graduate of the School of Agriculture. Oh, okay. I mean, it's it's okay. a specific seat. And uh, so, uh, and I've been through six elections since then. But uh, at any rate, I put in my vita uh, to send it so he could give it to the Alumni Association and went to Washington for a lobbying event and then uh, an event we can probably talk about, went to Russia for two weeks after that. Well, go ahead, yes, yeah. please, well, how that came about. Well, you, one of the questions I was told you would ask, what is one memory you have? Yes. And I think one day, there are a couple, three days I'll remember till the day Good. I die, obviously. You know, our firstborn child, that you'll never forget that young man who now has a Purdue degree. Uh, and uh, another one that I'll talk about, uh, in 1989, I was in Washington doing things and away, and my wife called and said the, the lieutenant governor's called and they want to bring Boris Yeltsin to the farm on Friday. And so I beat him back a couple days later, I got there. And <laughs> that hour and a half with Boris Yeltsin is a memory we'll always have. Oh, I would think so. And that precipitated a number of trips back to Russia uh, because, you know, Yeltsin had been on our place and all of that. and, and it. It was certainly an, an incredibly interesting time. Uh, we opened some doors. I'm sad to say that many of those are closing again. Mm. But, uh, but they are entrepreneurial. Right. Yeah. What kind of, what do you uh, raise on your farm? Do you have just animals? Do you have? Uh, well, we have crops, okay. uh, but at our headquarters, uh, we have, uh, we raise pigs uh, from, you know, we, we have the mothers, and most everything is done by artificial insemination, and then they are raised up. And I, I can remember uh, f feeling like when Yeltsin was there, I was walking in a s school of fish because the cameraman would keep running around us uh, <laughs> to, to take their pictures. But, and he asked a lot of questions. He'd obviously been on farms. And from what I'd gotten from the briefing papers that came to me beforehand, he does have some English, or he did have. The man's passed away now. Yeah. But uh, did but, he speak some things in English? Too? Yeah. Well, like radio, radio, and uh, we talked about a combine and how it was made so that it 
would uh, do more work for its weight. And he came back wanting to know what the down pressure was on the tires. And there was one time, we actually had a, a, an interpreter from the United Nations that was there that day. And, uh, and he asked a question, a technical question, and I gave what I thought was the answer, which, and he said, that sounds high. And the difference was how many pigs are killed by when the mother lays on them, and a few ha it happens to a few when they're little. And the other was what was the total death loss. So he knew, and of course the big thing was to see where our employees lived. And he asked my, at that time, 12-year-old uh, son, uh, are, do you want to do this? Are you going to inherit this farm? He was worried. It, trying to figure out how the capitalists work. And when he got to the West Coast at the conclusion, uh, they asked him what he thought of Americans. And, and it came back to me, because I wasn't there to see this, that you know, most of the time he was meeting with government officials and heads of chambers of commerce and business leaders. And he said, well, I don't know if I got to really meet many real Americans, but I think I did on a pig farm. So, uh, you know, th those are memories we'll keep. means a lot, that's we'll right, keep. exactly. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the Board of Trustees then, um, and you got on in, in 1992, correct? Right, right. And uh, one of the committees, are you on the Finance Committee or some of the committees that you're Okay, on? well, uh, the way that worked, uh, I was on the Finance Committee, and when I was elected to be Vice Chair, our bylaws prevent either the chairman or vice chairman from serving directly on the finance committee as a, a way of checks and balances. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was on the, f uh, I was on the uh, fiscal facilities committee for a while, and then uh, I was on the member of the finance committee, and when Bill Moreau retired, I chaired it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of action in all the committees, but that one is really important. That's right. And uh, let's make, uh, you were the co-chair of the search committee for the replacement for Dr. Jeske. Yes. Yeah. But, and as others have said, that the selection of the president is the most important for the Board of Trustees. Well, it's certainly the most time-consuming and energizing. They have added that on, too, but because uh, yes, yes. I've interviewed several members of the board. Yeah, and, well. and, and I agree. I mean, I can see that. It, it's self-evident to me. You know, and, and if you don't mind, I'll predate that, because going through the, ex well, let me just start. Dr. Dr. Beering uh, was an incredibly dedicated person and incredibly committed to Purdue. And he, you know, he's a physician by training. And he would look at you as an individual and he would really evaluate how to deal with you as an individual. And, uh, and I think truly an introverted person who changed himself to do this job. Uh, and it was really very much of a partnership. And uh, he and I had a difference of opinion, but it was a friendly one over the value of strategic planning. And the search for Martin Jiske uh, was one that, what stood out to me about Martin was the questions he asked, not the questions we asked, because there was just a higher level of understanding about how to, to do this. And uh, we all felt very good about that. And that was led by Chairman Tim McGinley. And Tim, uh, Tim uh, remembered, because Tim is a person who protects process and keeps openness in how the, this board has worked. And, and those lessons were really applied as we did our best in that search. And as a farmer who has others who work with me, uh, oftentimes there would be a corporate board meeting where uh, I sort of had to go on, you know. Uh, obviously we'd get people together. Sure. But it was, uh, for about six or seven months, it was all-encompassing. And I will never forget the first time, you know, we were sneaking around. The first time I met France, I can't talk about all the other yeah. really outstanding people we got to talk about, talk to. But I first met her in Ontario, California. And I had with me... Uh, uh, Maimon Powers, who's a trustee, and Diane Dennis, and then the head of the faculty at that time, Bernie Tao. And we all learned something. As we actually met four different candidates in 30 hours on that particular swing. But uh, one of the things I'll talk about with the search that needs to be understood and respected from a trustee standpoint and is... And from a researcher who would be studying the university. Yeah, well, point. the value of the input from the faculty and the value that that's one time when members of the Board of Trustees and the faculty truly can interact. 
and you can't help but be impressed by the quality of people that are here. And it puts an, a greater burden on us not to let them down. So it was uh, an amazing experience doing that with uh, Mike Burke, who's been so generous to Purdue and, and adds gravitas to what we are about. Right. So, uh, so that was very special. On the, on the, I'm thinking of something the researcher might ask about. How do they select the chairs for the for the presidential search? Uh, does the chairman of the board make that decision, or? Well, he certainly recruited us, okay. uh, and uh, and felt that he he actually did it. He was chairman, and he felt that he knew he was near the end. That he wanted others to help bear that responsibility. Okay. Okay. And we were at an early point in the trans. You know, you get a different crew usually when the governor changes because seven of the trustees are appointed by the governor. That's right. And uh, so uh, we worked that in, and okay. uh, we had five trustees and. We total about 15 people right. on the board. On That's that good. Search I'm thinking committee. of the researchers that might, you know, right. wonder how how the decision is made for the chairing of the committee. And, and, the and, but as much as as important, you know, so it's about people who have longevity and perspective, sure. and and some appreciation for the process. And it's a, it's a there were so many people that could have been put on the board, and I think. Uh, in any oral history process, one person I want to remember particularly is Professor Stan Hem of the pharmacy department, who had not only been part of a fail search prior to President Beering, but came back to help us in the Jiski search and did everything he could to help coalesce the faculty and give really great input in the in the Jiski search. Mm. And he helped us get ready for the next one. Uh, and and Bernie Tao was did yeoman work as well at that oh, time. Both good. The uh, now the next thing I was going to ask a couple things. On the secretary to the board, Doris Pearson. Yes. Yeah, you know, she'd been on for a long time. You made a you know, a meticulous professional who really cared about doing this job right. And excuse me, I have interviewed Doris, so yeah. I was really glad to. She's very personable, and I've known her sort of over the years before I got when she was around. Doris is a real lady, yeah. and you know. There were standards to be kept, and I want to say that Rosanna Berenger, her successor, it's has fair. followed that. Right. And uh, neat people, both of them. No, there are no problem kind of people, and they. Some trustees are higher maintenance than others. <laughs> and uh, but she really, <laughs> she she really has done a lot, uh, yeah. both of them, to keep us focused. And there's never a problem with requests, uh, as far as getting information quickly right. and. Uh, it's just it's been a it was a great experience. We had a board that stayed the same for a long time, sure. and there was a lot of trust and uh, good working relationship. Good working relationship, right. and yeah. you know the only danger we had was we didn't have an outlier. And, and I think <laughs> a, a good board takes an outlier to challenge and question. That's right. Good uh, point. Right. Yeah. And then you have your student trustee, and of course the current the current one is Jill Steiner, and uh, but and the trustees have been on since seventy five. And they, students. The student, the student yeah, trustee, yeah. right? And they added a, a dimension. Yeah, and and that changed. I think they were there were representatives to the board, and then they became a full right. trustee a little later than that. Uh, That's right. The new uh, lobbying person uh, was actually a student trustee, and Mark, or in that role, sure. And Mark Townsend was as well, who was a fellow trustee. That's right. The thing I will say about the student trustees is they've all been spectacular. Some have had bigger chances to shine than others. And I can tell you a story about every one of them, uh, you know, uh, uh, that are just really special people. Yeah, and uh, we're, I'm gonna, I haven't been able to interview him, but I'm going to I'm going to have yeah. coffee with Jill, so maybe we can try to do it before she gets off the yes, board. Yes, well, try to work you know, around uh, it. Right. Amanda Teeter, uh, yeah. just a lot of people that are right. really sp who was with us during the Jiski search, and right. just a number of them. The strategic plan, making a couple comments. You've been certainly the board was involved in that. Yes, well, okay. as I say, on the day. Martin Jiski had his first news conference in the Loeb Playhouse. The, uh, <laughs> the current lobbyist sidled up to me and he said, John, I think you're going to get your strategic plan. <laughs> and that was kind of one of those moments when I felt that's, that's, that's okay. And the thing of it was, in our evaluation of Dr. Jiski, we could see what had been done where he'd been elsewhere, that they were honest, they were data-driven. You know, some of these are sort of flights of fancy rather than sure. prescriptions for change. Right. And I'd come f from it in my leadership of the National Pork Council that 
a much less sophisticated situation, but that it became a way to prioritize board action. Does this fit where we really said we want to go or doesn't it? And it can focus a volunteer board, but it is used so many other ways. And, and I continue to hear from our administrators that it really helps. Now, France came with a far more inclusive process. And, uh, but she's getting, I think, good ownership. Right. It's a very different leadership style that she has, but I think we're moving forward. Right. The, one of the things I thought the researchers would be interested in, that capital improvement, and uh, it's a 10-year plan, but you sort of update it. Uh, they might catch that on the interview, so want to make a comment on that. Well, uh, you know, that's a curious set of occasions, and particularly with Dr. Jiski, you know, I said he had an edifice complex. He liked to build buildings, <laughs> but... Uh, we see them on State Street. <laughs> yeah, well, you see them everywhere. He, right. he really, you know, when you went, you went for 15 years with two or three, and then you had right. this explosion. Right. Uh, when you began to depend upon others besides the state to build those buildings, uh, it then became what are the things, you know, there's a portion that was because we really needed it, and then there was a portion of where can we get support to make this, what, what is our area of focus? And during the Jiski years, a lot of that was engineering. And uh, what is in the future for us is in the life sciences, I suspect. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you never have enough resources to do everything. Right. But, but, but sciences, it's their turn looking forward. But uh, it, it is, it's been interesting to watch that evolution. Because when we first came to the state after saying, well, the state, whatever they fund, that's what we'll build. And we made a case for what we thought our highest priorities were. And when we approached the state, we said, well, if we build them, will you help us uh, R &R. run them, run them? Well, not only R&R, &R, but the heat and lights. and sure, right. And, um, and the state said, yeah, that sounds reasonable to us. And then as the state got more in financial trouble, they began to withdraw from even that commitment. And one of the interesting things, if people who run other universities ever look at any of this, Purdue has been very active in how they manage their finances. We uh, maintain a portion of our debt in very short term, seven to seven days to 30 days. And 95% of the time, that is at a significantly lower interest rate than term debt. And uh, that has generated savings of three to four million dollars a year, year after year. And the state has allowed us, until the last two years, to take that money and pay down the principal. So we eliminated debt quicker. And uh, the last two years, the states asked for the money back to save on their state budget. But I think it's really underappreciated the kind of rigorous financial management that Purdue has brought to bear. Uh, talking with the president this morning as we walked from executive session to, to the regular board meeting, she talked about how, how good the facilities are and how well they're, or at least how well they're maintained. Well, part of that is that there's been a tradition of power within that side of the house that those things were looked after. And, and those folks were all about maintaining capacity through relatively low time so that we could f go forward with our academic mission. All right. Good point. Very good. Okay. Now, of course, you're involved in the appointments of your deans and the chair and the chair and yeah. distinguished professors and things of that sort. Well, some of that is pro forma, but it sure. it is one of the most uplifting experiences we have when the named and distinguished professors come forward to hear their stories and to be supportive. Uh, you know, we try to respect the faculty process. Uh, there is an old story uh, that I that I love that uh, supposedly came from the early 20s at Purdue. <laughs> when a, uh, uh, one of the board members said, we ought to have the first motion of every board meeting to fire the president. And if it fails, we can adjourn. <laughs> but, in, but in essence, the board has to hire a president and hold them accountable. Right. Now, obviously, there are some, my different presidents go to different degrees to solicit our input. But uh, 
this president that we have now very much sticks to the faculty process. Right, that's good. And then Discovery Park, and that's really what well, you're talking about. That so that's. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, diversity. Okay. And again, for me, uh, mm. and I actually had a few words this morning in the board meeting, but in in my experience overseas and through life, there is a the world is getting much smaller and much of the conflict we see and the danger we see in the world is people from different cultures not being able to get along. You know, as one of my professors said, there's a difference of opinion of what God really intended in this moment. But on a, on a lower level, if our students are going to be truly productive, they have to be able to work in that environment and hopefully they make change in that environment. And if we don't prepare students to live and work in those situations, we have done them a huge disservice for the world they're going to be in. Mm -hmm. So that's a piece of it. I, many lessons that if you care for me to run on, I will. I, I, uh, uh, a young lady whose first name was Jody, uh, was the student trustee who was a, a young black lady from uh, Fort Wayne. Her mother was the superintendent of schools. There were things she told me about how it worked for her here that, that made me think differently than that small boy who went to grade school. Mm -hmm. I remember as a student here, one of the angriest people I knew was a young man from Cincinnati who's Mother was an architect and father was a physician, and he was brighter than any of us. But the slights really meant something to him, and if I'd have been in his shoes, they'd have meant something to me. Um, current trustee, Maimon Powers, who runs a very successful uh, uh, construction, construction company. company. Mm -hmm. And we were talking uh, one day in a very social situation about uh, the fact that traditionally there are a lot more men than women at Purdue, and more so in our time than now. And I offered to him the comment that, you know, even though I was a little bit geeky, if I really wanted to get a date, I could get a date at Purdue as a student. And Maimon looked at me and he says, do you realize that when I was here there were only 30 African American women? And that's in the late 60s. Wow. You know, this is a journey Purdue has to take. Uh, to make the most of all the human capital that's available to us. Right. And again, with my experiences and the places I've been, I've spent a, a fair amount of time in Japan and in the Orient, uh, we've got to be able to be prepared to both understand and compete right. and, and cooperate. Right, cooperate is a good point. Yeah, yeah. So, so those are some things. Yeah. Let's start the Access and Success um, campaign, which is a new one, and. Uh, there was that nice picture in the magazine when you were meeting with some of the students, the new ones for this right, year. It was right, a nice right. article, the alumnus. Well, I, that's a day I just really enjoyed, these bright, bright young people. You get energy. You even reflect, that even reflected in the picture. You, you, you get so much energy from them. Yeah. And, you know, one of my, long before I was a trustee, and, and, and I should say before I was either old or masterful, I was an old master. And I came back for that, and uh, in the two and a half to three days we were here, I understand why people choose to be professors. You know, the energy I got from those young people about their curiosity and, and the sense of the possible. I realize it was a special condition, but I can see it, why it people, comes through. Yeah. I can see why people make a career in academia. Right. Yeah. And uh, so, all, all good points. Yeah, that's a good program. The uh, campaign for Purdue. You were well, involved in that. Well, to some degree. Uh, right. The real leader is Mike Burke, mm -hmm. and who, you know, has been, his stock between 1980 and 2000 was the most successful one in, in, the, in, the, in, in the United States, in, in Tell Labs. Now, he's in the telecom business, so it hasn't been so good since then, but the company's still profitable mm -hmm. and goes forward. But Mike has stepped up with a huge sums of money. And as a trustee, you know, that led to Discovery Park, and he was co-chair of the campaign. Right. Uh, his example made a powerful source to other people of wealth. But the process 
it made us really think about people we had no idea of. Jerry Rawls, who gave money for the new Cranard edition. Nobody knew about him till all of a sudden he kind of volunteered, you know. Uh, it really helped us be more connected. Right. And the thing about Mike that has to be said, I can remember a time uh, when we didn't really, other than a name on a list, we didn't know Martin Jiske. He wrote a concise paper about how you engineer change, the kind of leaders you look for, that was just a revelation. And, you know, he, he, Mike doesn't talk a lot in board meetings, but I always listen carefully when he does. And he will be a giant in the annals of this, uh, yeah, of this institution. That's, that's very nice. Well, the other thing I was going to, now that the chairman is stepping down, so there'll be some changes. Yeah. Right. Um, and I thought your comment was very grateful for McGinley's leadership and commitment to Purdue, which you mentioned earlier, and that was from the students to administrators in the community, and certainly that's true, having interacted with them. Yeah, he, he's truly a servant leader. Right. A couple of your awards. I thought that Ag Alumni Association, the Certificate of Distinction, is, is quite good, you want, and Pork Industry, so you make a couple comments on your awards. All of them are outstanding. Yeah. Well, uh, do the, some of them come as a surprise? Sometimes I ask people, and I say, "Well, well, usually they ask me to be there or something." Yeah, when <laughs> when you know it's coming. Uh, 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 I have a, my my vision of myself is that I try to try to be favorable to change, even if it's uncomfortable, right. and change that makes a difference for people, and uh, and so uh, I I remember. Uh, the dean, I prior to ever being a trustee or anything, he made the comment that I ask hard questions in a nice way, <laughs> and I that's hope that's okay. true. But I, we were trying to focus in on some things. Now this was long prior to being a trustee, and somehow it percolated through the system before I was a trustee that I would have that award. And uh, a couple of organizations I've led uh, uh, have given me the old guy award at some point in time, and uh, that's nice, and it's nice to share with my children. But there are things where I think we move the needle. Right. Talk, talk about family. Do you, do you all, I mean, your children? That yeah, we ha we ha uh, yes. And my, my wife, Vicki, who I say is the best thing I got from Purdue, uh, graduated a year after I did. And did you meet her here? Yes. Oh. In fact, our, ro our first eyes of each other came in the Cranert Library. And she she is a graduate in I'll speech. I have to tell John Halkas that he's dead. He was the librarian yeah, for a long yeah. time. Uh, our, uh, and in fact, uh, after I had been to New Zealand, uh, the class I would with had graduated. So I uh, hooked up with a, a, a former roommate who was in graduate school and lived in an apartment. And upstairs was a fellow who, uh, who's now the head of the Agricultural Economics Department at the University of Wyoming. And he kind of had eyes for Vicki, my wife. and. Uh, they weren't, it, he just wasn't making progress, and I said, well, you want me to see if I can get a date and see what the problem is? And that's literally how our relationship began. <laughs> and we've been fortunate enough to have two children. Uh, our son, David, graduated from Purdue in 1996 and uh, was away for seven years, got his MBA in Chicago at DePaul and worked on the Chicago Board of Trade, among other things. And he's come back and he manages the swine piece of our operation and is beginning to expand his own farming as well. Mm -hmm. And then we have a daughter, Anne, who um, uh, graduated from high school in 1996 and a very intense young woman who uh, has a doctor of pharmacy from Purdue that she got in 2002. And uh, at one of the treasured Purdue moments for me, uh, they allowed me to put her hood on when she got her doctorate. And uh, of course, That's I was very special. I was incredibly nervous, and uh, in fact, more so than I walked when I walked her down the aisle for her wedding. I got more nervous to do that. <laughs> I knocked off her mortarboard, but we still got to hug. And you know, like a lot of parents, uh, you know, you give your children roots and wings, and uh, and I'm I give all the credit to my wife because you know, uh, you know, we've been together a long time. But there were times I can remember. Uh, the, the year my son graduated from high school in late June, he looked over at Vicki and he said, where's dad? And I'd been gone a week and she said, Denmark. And you know, uh, Vicki <laughs> did an awful lot of this. And sure. she, the other thing, the culture at Purdue is changing as we get more out of state uh, trustees. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> and th these are in people of incredible accomplishment and capacity. But uh, Bob Jesse, who mentored me and was the board chairman prior to Tim McGinley, and Byron Anderson, who was in the slot I'm in when I first came on the board, really uh, drilled into us the responsibility to be there at graduations. And as you can imagine, since 1992, I've sat through a fair few. Sure. But it is the one, and, and my wife Vicki has been there to look after honorary degree candidates' families, and she's been incredibly helpful while not being in the limelight right. and put an awful lot of time into that. So uh, for me, that tradition, the fact that we have a very dignified graduation that creates high emotion for people is incredibly special. And I think it's important to memorialize Dr. Stephen Beering, who gave a different speech to every graduation. I've heard that, right. I mean, you know, seven or eight, now they might have had common themes, but seven or eight different speeches. Was not the same. It was not the same. And the most important thing about all that, to realize he gave those speeches in English, which was his third language, because he knew German and French. He was a, he's a true Renaissance man. That's right. And his devotion, I mean, I, I, I hope somebody remembers yeah. how special that was. Right. Uh, you mentioned about your uh, tradition and outstanding event, and I'll leave some, I'll let the, make any closing comments or looking back, what you'd like to say, summary. Well, uh, the, you know, in addition to my business, right. I've, uh, I, while I haven't made fortunes, I had the ability to give time away to other things. And it's where the true richness in our lives has been. And there are, really special and incredible people throughout this university, as there are in many others. Right. But uh, it, it has been a real privilege, and I have tried to keep as my guiding light when I've served on the board what is best for the long-term interests of this place, and we'll let the rest of it go. Right. Very nice. Nicely said. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Hardy. you. I appreciate that very much. I <laughs> hope I didn't carry on too long. No, no. no.